Aggression by terror against the peaceful villagers of South Vietnam. A middle of the night rocket attack on the U.S. air base at Da Nang kills eight Americans, wounds 173, and destroys 11 aircraft. The Americans are responding with the greatest concentration of conventional firepower in history. Zero. 680100. Zero, zero. Uh, Southeast. Emergency medevac, ASAP. And now, three weeks after the offensive began, the firing still goes on. And the months ahead look grimmer than ever. I have therefore directed General Norman Schwarzkopf to use all forces available, including ground forces, to eject the Iraqi army from Kuwait. A quarter of all Somali children under the age of five have already died. It is clear that the scale of the famine there is even worse than we thought. Today I want to talk with you about our nation's military involvement in Somalia. This one hospital took in 300 wounded people eight days ago. Somalia's marauding gangs show no mercy. A starvation brought on not only by drought, but also by the anarchy that then prevailed in that country. Another victory for the wanted warlord named I.D. When the first Black Hawk helicopter was down this weekend, some 90 of them formed a perimeter around the helicopter, and they held that ground under intensely heavy fire. They stayed with their comrades. That's the kind of soldiers they are. That's the kind of people we are. I'm Mike Brock. I'm a retired Marine Colonel. I served 26 years. I'm a veteran of Vietnam, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and Somalia. I was born in Oklahoma, and I, um, my parents were divorced, so I was back and forth between Oklahoma and Lakeview, Oregon. I went to high school in Lakeview, Southern Oregon College. After I graduated, I went to uh, Alaska for a little bit, and I came back, uh, went to San Francisco, and then I got reclassified from a student to being 1A. I went to the Navy, the Air Force, I talked to the Army and the Coast Guard, and the Army had a good program to be a second lieutenant. And as I was walking out, I saw this sign says Marines, and, and uh, I said, oh, gee whiz, you know, Marines, Sergeant Stryker, Sands, Iwo Jima, John Wayne, I'll go talk to those guys. So I go into the office, and the guy was probably a staff sergeant, gunnery sergeant, he had a whole bunch of stripes on his sleeve. And he says, uh, you a college guy? And I said, yes. And he said, did you graduate? And I said, yes. And he said, do you want to be an officer? And I said, yes. And he says, well, you need to go see the OSO. And I uh, went down to the officer selection office and walked in. I never got more than maybe three, five steps. And this captain gets up and from behind the desk and walks up and shakes my hand and then tells me all about the Marine Corps. But he says, I don't want you to make a decision today. Go think about it and come back in a couple of days. So I did, and I went back and I said, well, you know, I've been thinking about it and I think I'll uh, go with you guys maybe. And he says, well, I've been thinking about you. And he says, I don't think you have what it takes to be a Marine officer. And about that point, I said, give me those papers and signed my life away. <laughs> I arrived in Da Nang and I was sent down to a, a battalion to be a platoon commander. Hotel company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines. I was the 3rd platoon commander. So the staff sergeant that I had came over and introduced himself and he took me outside and he says, here's your squad leaders, what do you want to tell them? I was dumbfounded. So I said, well, it's, I didn't come here to be a hero. And as far as I'm concerned, my mission is to get as many of you guys home alive as I possibly can. So that was my introduction to the, my troops. We were south of Da Nang, and our major mission was to keep rockets from being fired into Da Nang, and uh, we just did a lot of patrolling. We'd go out for three days, come back for a day, go out for three days, come back for a day, go out three days again. We were in what was called booby trap heaven. 
The VC realized that they couldn't really take on the Marines very effectively. They, they were going to lose because of the firepower disproportionately in our favor. So they became experts at putting up booby traps, mostly pressure release uh, booby traps or trip wires. And they'd take a 105 round that we'd fire and take the uh, explosives out of it and have a pressure or a trip wire type booby trap. So you could walk in a patrol area and you might have missed it that time. The next time you might have missed it, but the third or fourth time somebody might step on it, pull the wire and it would trip it and inflict casually, usually traumatic amputation of the leg is what usually happened. And that's the way they inflicted most of the casualties on us. So it was uh, frustrating in that sense. I'd gone on an operation with the uh, Republic of Korea Marines, and I watched how they operated and how they searched areas. And so I said, hey, we're not doing it like the, the rocks do. And so I went up and told the, one of the guys, give me your probe stick, which is how you probe for mines. And I went up on a berm and started probing real deep and pretty soon I hit something. And then I thought, well, this could be my last day. So I told everybody, hey, I've, I've hit something and stay away. And then I cleaned it off and I found a cache uh, full of rice and uh, grenades and a pay book for the VC. And then the whole battalion came back and we swept through it and we took tons of grenades and AK-47s. So I felt pretty good about that. I would say it's more that you worry before you get into something about what could happen. And then once you're in it, you're so busy, you don't have time to be scared anymore. We went down the river and went up this real narrow canal and I was getting real nervous because I said, when we come back out of here, all it takes is one grenade, one chai com, and we're, we're toast and went out in the main channel of the river and it's big and wide and we went up the river about i don't know 500 yards or so and about five or six of them opened up full automatic and you could see the bullets impacting in the water the marines like always you have an initial reaction is to get down well there was nothing to get down behind except this quarter inch of fiberglass. So I started yelling, shoot, shoot back at the bullets coming through the water. One uh, Marine had a M79, which is a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. And he was pretty nervous. Uh, and when he shot, I realized he was shooting up in the air because one of the rounds impacted right behind the boat. Uh, I was surprised that none of us got got hurt from that and I uh, started yelling at him, let me give it to me and he, he had a death grip on it, wouldn't give it to me so I, uh, I yelled at him to shoot at the tree line and he shot basically straight up in the air again and it came down, I can't remember how, how close to the boat but it was close enough to get my attention again and I took my pistol out and put it up to his face and I said shoot at the tree line or I'm going to blow your head off and he did. And that broke the ambush. And then when we got back uh, to the shore, back to the to the bridge, I took him aside with one other Marine that was on the boat and said, look, you were firing straight up. It hit real close to the boat. I thought you might have a round land in the boat and you would have killed more of us than they did. So you uh, you do what you have to do and I, I won't uh, say anything other than yes, that's what I did and I never heard another thing from it after that. When we first started landing in uh, Da Nang, Vietnam, a Marine sitting beside me said, what's all that smoke? They must under, be under heavy attack. And I said, no, they're, they're just burning waste. And my wife uh, flew, uh, does fly for an airline, Flying Tigers, and uh, I'll let her explain about some of her experiences.
I'm Diane Brock, Mike's wife. I'm the general of the house. We've been married 53 years. I'm the private. <laughs> <laughs> should say the recruit. When we would um, go over to uh, Vietnam, uh, you'd go uh, stop in Alaska, stop in um, um, Okinawa, or uh, stop in Okinawa, yeah, and then go into Vietnam. When we'd land in Da Nang or Cameron Bay, we'd all go into the op center and I'd try to call him. When we're on patrol in Vietnam, uh, we got a uh, radio operator came up to me and said, Sir Selfish, which is the battalion commander's call sign, uh, is on the line. And I said, tell them to call Hotel, which is my company commander, to uh, call them. You just got Hotel 3 and we're busy. And he does that. And then they call back and say, you know, they're calling again. He says, sir, they're calling again. I said, you tell them. I said, you know, get off the line. And then he stands there a few seconds later and he says, it's selfish six, six actual. And I just kind of pale. I went, hold oh, what did I do? It's a battalion commander. And when I answered, I said, you know, hotel three actual. And he says, stand by. And then I got to listen to her for a few, few seconds. That one was pretty garbled because it was so many patches down, but the one in the COC was better. It was wonderful, but weird because you're just surrounded with people. Luckily, there was no firefights going on, so she could do it. Everybody got away from me so we could talk, but there's no privacy. And you can't say anything intimate. You, we were newly married. You, you know, there are things you want to say, but um, you can't. So how's the weather? I mean, it was just not a not not a real in-depth conversation, you know. But uh, but but wonderful to be able to do that. Phone calls were brief, and I always wondered because he was out in the field, you know. So this was they had to what did they had to turn the receivers that went from radio to radio, yeah, right? They did a patch of some kind so that she could talk to me over the radio, and that's why I said it was really. In the COC when I was there, that was different. But out in the field, it was really scratchy and hard. To... That's why I needed somebody to repeat it. And, and um, yeah, I, I, to, be able to, to be able to do that, I felt, I mean, that was a thrill. Not too many guys that had their wives in Vietnam, very few. Now, I know there were some, but not, not that many. And, I would guess, I'd make the assumption that no one else was able to talk to their wife while they were out on a patrol. Yeah, I don't, I don't know anybody that had that experience, no. I was uh, promoted to first lieutenant, and you're no longer a platoon commander once you get promoted because you're not a second lieutenant anymore, and we had a ton of second lieutenants come in, so they made me the executive officer of H&S Company. And they uh, came to me one day and said, are you the lieutenant that has a wife that uh, flies for Flying Tiger? And I said, yes, I am. And he, they said, uh, she ever go to Okinawa? And I said, yeah, sometimes. And they said, pack your bags, you're leaving tomorrow. So I left in September of 1969. So I got a three month early out of Vietnam. And I went to 3rd Force Service Regiment and was uh, XO of a company there till I came home. Here, let me show you some photo albums that I have. This is a picture of uh, when I got promoted to first lieutenant in Vietnam by uh, my battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Glasgow, who later became a three-star general, and Captain Shulge were promoting me. Uh, I think that was in April. I have some, a couple other pictures that showed me what I really would normally wore because I had to dress up for this. Uh, just wore a t-shirt with a cover and a pistol. It's just landing right now, Tom, on the south lawn of the White House. Yesterday, after conferring with my senior national security advisors and following extensive 
consultations with our coalition partners. Uh, Saddam Hussein was given one last chance, set forth in very explicit terms to do what he should have done more than six months ago. I went to Oregon to see my dad before I took over as the commanding officer of the Surveillance and Reconnaissance Intelligence Group. And <clears throat> then I went, had gone to Ashland and I got a phone call. And they said, where are you? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm in Oregon. And they said, don't you know what's going on? And I said, no, I don't. And he says, there's a war going on. Uh, Saddam Hussein has invaded Kuwait. Don't you know that? And I said, no, I've been out camping. I didn't have a radio or anything. I was just camping with my dad. And they said, get back. So I drove that day back to Camp Pendleton, and then uh, within a couple of days, I had a change of command in the office with the former commander, and, uh, and on the 13th, I think, of August, I took off for Saudi Arabia.